Good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 7, and uh, here with your last lecture for the week. Uh, this one is going to be over using quotations and structuring literary papers, um, information that is very important for you as you draft and work on your first papers. So let's begin by using quotations. Um, everything that I'm going to go over today is over handouts, and all these handouts are in the course document, so you'll be able to find them there. Um, the handout on using quotations is relatively long uh, because I'm packing a lot of information in here. I am not going to go over the entire handout in this uh, lecture just because I want to keep it brief, but one of the things that I wanted to say is this. Using quotations in your paper is a very effective way to support your thesis and your argument, and it becomes very important in literary papers, the papers that you're doing for this course, because those quotations serve to illustrate your point. And even though you know that I've already read the materials that we're going to discuss, that does not mean that you don't need to have them in your, you do not need to have quotations in your papers. You should, because when I'm grading your papers, I am not going to have those sources in front of me. And if there's a particular point that you're making that's related to something in the story or the poem or the play, you need to include that in your paper. However, when you're using quotations, be very careful. Don't put them in to just give matter of fact details like plot summary. Only use the quotations if they're being used to support an argument that you're making. Like, for instance, if you're writing about the story of an hour and you said that Miss Mallard had doubts about loving her husband, there is a quotation in that story that emphasizes what you've just said. So that's when you want to use a quotation, when it emphasizes or supports a point that you just made. So you want to be very careful there. To that end, there are different ways to use quotations. Um, there's a different method in terms of citation, and uh, there's a different method. Of, uh, there's two different ways to incorporate quotations into a paper. Uh, one thing that you can do is you can incorporate it into your own sentence. So in this first example, this is a uh, from a short story. It's not one that we're going to read, but there's a quotation in that story that is a long strand of iron gray hair. That's from the story. But what I've done here is I've incorporated that quotation into my own sentence. So the first part on the second pillow that people find, that's my own sentence. Then I put in the quotation. So one way that you can do is you can incorporate the quotation into your own sentence. But the thing that you have to be very careful here is it has to read as one sentence. So if you read this all together, it reads as one complete sentence. So that's one way to do a quotation. Another way of doing a quotation is if you have a sentence before that introduces the quotation. So if you look at this second example, Gilman refers to her own history when she mentions Weir Mitchell in the story. That's a separate sentence um, and it can stand by itself. Then you put a colon and then you give the quotation. John says, if I don't pick up faster, he'll send me to Weir Mitchell, which shows an example of that. I want you to also take note of these two things here. These are parenthetical citations for a short story and for a play. So this will apply also when you do disgrace. For the parenthetical citation, after the quotation, you open up parentheses, give the author's last name, the page number, close parentheses, and period. Um, notice there is no punctuation between the author's last name and the page number. And notice that the punctuation goes after the parentheses, not before. So you don't put one there and then one there. You just put one there. Now, if you look at this example, you notice that this is different than this one on 170, this one with the Charlotte Perkins Gilman story. The difference here is I've mentioned the author's last name in my uh, quote in my um, sentence. And because I mentioned the author's last name in my sentence, I don't need to put it in citation. So if you go back to the first one with Faulkner, his name is not in my sentence, so I need to put it in the citation. But if you go back to the second one, her name is in my sentence, and so I don't put it in the citation. After both of these is explanations, explaining that 
there are occasions where you might want to quote four lines or more. Uh, first of all, I want you to be very careful here. Only quote that number of lines if you make direct reference to everything that you've quoted. If you don't make direct reference to everything that you quoted, then you don't need all four of those lines. But if you quote four lines or more, uh, you use a different method. You use something called block method. And so instead of incorporating the quotation into your sentences, as I've done with these two examples here, you put a colon after your introduction, then you give the quotation. Notice that it's indented. There are no quotation marks around it. And notice that with the parenthetical citation, it comes at the very end. Um, so this is something that you need to keep aware of. So just take a look at this carefully uh, when you're getting ready to use citations. Um, the next one deals with quoting from poetry. Uh, even though we're not talking about that just yet, because uh, this is uh, uh, our next assignment, let me just go ahead and tell you this. Uh, so with poetry, it's essentially the same thing in terms of either incorporating the quotation into your own sentence or introducing it. So you see here, the speaker emphasizes that his father also worked on days of rest. That's a complete sentence, colon, quotation, um, and quotation, parenthetic citation. And then in the next one, what I've done is I've included the quotation into my own sentence. So same format. The only difference is with parenthetical citation. So when we were talking about short stories, the 38 is the page number, 175 is the page number. When you're doing poetry, instead of giving the page number, you give the line number. So a poem is divided up into lines. And so in this first one, that's from line one. And then from this one, these are lines 13 through 14. With poetry, you do not need to put the author's last name into the citation. Um, so it's just the page number. So the two things that you really need to remember from this handout is the two ways to use quotations, either putting it into your own sentence or introducing it first, and the difference in citations. For short stories, it is the author's last name and page number if it's not mentioned in your sentence, or it's just the page number if the author's name is mentioned in your sentence. Um, I know this is a bit a, lo a lot to take in. So my suggestion for you is in your own time, read this whole document very carefully. The quiz over using quotations is somewhat complicated and complex, um, but it's still on the same thing. And for that quiz, I'm allowing you three opportunities to take it, uh, just because it is a somewhat complex quiz. There's only two questions on there. Uh, because of the complexity, though, you can take it three times. Uh, it also has to be manually graded. So once I grade it, I'll give you feedback, and then you can redo it uh, as many times, well, at least three times. So uh, that's using quotations. Um, let me now go to structuring a literary paper. Now, in structuring papers, a lot of this information is going to be similar to what you read um, yesterday on writing introductions, body paragraphs, and um, conclusions. Uh, this one is just a little bit more fine-tuned, um, so let me go back to it and let me enlarge it a bit. So, introduction. Um, Essentially, it's the same thing that we talked about with the lead uh, yesterday, which is that general concept, uh, the bridge, that transition to your um, thesis statement. Uh, the thing about the literary paper, though, you need to give the author's full name and the complete title of the literary work that you're discussing in your paper. So for this first paper, you're doing either Shirley Jackson's The Lottery or you're doing Alice Walker's Everyday Use. And so in that introduction, you need to get the full name and the title of the work. Title of short stories are in quotation marks. So it is um, Shirley Jackson's open quotations, the lottery, close quotations. Alice Walker, open quotations, everyday use, close quotations. Um, once you mention the author's full name in the introduction, you don't have to use the author's full name again. So you can just use the last name, like Walker emphasizes or Jackson elaborates. 
Also, when writing literary papers, you want to use the present tense. Uh, it's called the literary present. And the reason why is that literary works are thought of as consistent in a eternal present. So that whenever somebody else is, when somebody reads the work, it's always new to them. So if you're talking about D, you'll, you'll write D argues or D believes. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you use the present tense. In terms of the body paragraph, um, one of the most important things that you need to remember is that each body paragraph has one topic on one point. So like for instance, if you're writing about everyday use and you want to write about how mama is afraid of D, that's one paragraph. So everything in that paragraph has to be related to why you think mama's afraid of D. You have to explain why you believe that, then most importantly, you have to support that. And once again, the way that you support that is by using the quotations. But also be careful with the quotations. You don't just want to put them in there. You need to also point out to your reader why you're using the quotation, why this quotation is important, what it is doing. So you need to analyze the quotation. So it can't just be there standing by itself. Um, you need to show some engagement with it. In terms of the conclusion, the conclusion reminds your reader of the general ideal and concept of your paper. It touches up on your main points, but it needs to do more than simply repeat what you've already stated. Um, it needs to leave your reader with a decisive statement about your topic um, and how your interpretation has influenced the way that we view this work. And also, really good conclusions return to the introduction. So if you've begun your introduction by talking about, I don't know, a song or an incident, a good conclusion will return back to that song or back to that incident. And what it does, it, it gives the whole paper a sense of unity. The last thing that I want to talk about is MLA formatting, because this is where the bonus points come in. So. On the very top of your page, in the top left-hand margin, you need your first name and last name. Um, so whatever your first name is and your last name. Then double space, you need to put Professor Sexton. Then double space, English 102.jand. And then you need to give the date that the paper is due. Now keep in mind, the date is in a European format. So you put the number first, uh, so 10, you spell out the month, January, and you give all four digits of the year, 2021. On the top right-hand page, you give the page number, but the page number has to be included with your last name. So like, for instance, I said that it was me writing the paper, I would put Sexton one. On every subsequent page, you do Sexton two, Sexton three. You do, not re, you do not need to repeat this first part. So this part only goes on the first, on the first page, but the last name and page number goes on every, on every page. Uh, and then you double space and you give a title. Um, what's your titles? I'm trying to think of something creative for your title or something that's related to what your topic is about. Uh, we haven't talked about titles in detail just yet. So for this first paper, there's not going to be any penalties if you don't have a great title, but you need some type of title. Um, and so for this first paper, you're looking at a way of just, just practicing. And then that allows me to give a comment on it. One other thing that I wanted to share with you, and this is also in course documents, um, is paper formatting. Because I want you to see an example of what the MLA paper formatting looks like. So this is from a previous student in another class. But notice, the student gives his first name and last name, then my name, Professor Sexton, the course that he was in, English 101-H24E, then the date, notice that he has it correct, the number 18, he spelled out the month of February, all four digits of the year, 2016. In the top right-hand uh, margin, you see that he's put his last name and the page number and his title. You go to his other pages, you see on his second page, he has Lee two. And on his third page, he has Lee three. 
So let's go back to that five points for bonus points. So in order to get the bonus points, and it's five points per paper, uh, in order to get the bonus points, all of this has to be exactly correct. Um, there's no partial points here. It's zero or five. So let's say that you have this, this, and this, but let's say that for the date you have February 18, 2016, that's wrong. You're not gonna get the points. Um, let's say that you have all of this on the first page, but on the second page, you don't have the page number. And on the third page, you don't have the page number. You're not gonna get the points. So. For that MLA bonus formatting, everything has to be there, and it has to be right. All it all has to be right. So one little mistake means no bonus points whatsoever. So there are no partial points there, um, and, and then you know, that's just what it is. So this was the information about using quotations and about structuring the literature paper. Uh, definitely look back over the using quotation uh, handout and read it carefully before you do the quiz. There's also a quiz on structuring the literary paper. These are the last quizzes discussion boards for this week, um, and we won't start them again on, until next Monday. Um, I hope that all of you are having a good week and managing the class well. Uh, I will see you tomorrow morning, January 8th from 9 a.m. to 9.50. Keep in mind that the tomorrow's meeting is mostly an opportunity for us to discuss the two literary works, but most importantly, for you to ask any questions that you have. So tomorrow, it won't be so much of me lecturing as it will be you asking me questions. Um, so tomorrow hinges a lot on you. All right, hope everyone is doing well and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye.